So last week, John started a new series for us for the summer, um, looking at some of the values of Harvard Church, what's important to us at Harvard Church. Um, and I'm excited for this series to kind of take a step back and, and look at where we've been and where we're going next and what's really important as we're here as our church family. Um, so this morning, we're going to go back to the Old Testament and look at Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4. So if you happen to have a Bible with you, you can turn with me there. Otherwise, I'll just read it for you. So Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We pray with me. God, we thank you for these words and we ask that, we, that you teach us from your word this morning. Teach us more about who you are and about who we are as your children in our life together here at Harbor Church. In your name we pray. Amen. This is one of those famous passages that you've probably heard countless times and heard lots of sermons. If you grew up in Sunday school and that kind of thing, you probably memorized it at some point. I know I did. But I think it has some really important things to say to us today at Harbor Church about why we do what we do and what exactly we're doing here. This passage calls us to love God with everything that we are, all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And then it kind of tells us what that looks like. Everything that comes after sort of just shows what if you love your God with everything, what do you do? What does that look like? It says when we love God, we share our faith. We share God's commands. We share what God has done in our life. We teach the gospel to children. We keep our faith and our love for God so visible and so at the <coughs> forefront of our lives and our minds that it's like it's written on our foreheads or all over our hands or the doors of our houses. It calls us to love God with who we are. And it says that when we love God with everything, with all of our hearts and minds and strength, we can't keep that faith to ourselves. It's not really an option. We can't, we can't just exist for ourselves or pretend that this is just personal. We have to share it. If we really love God with everything, we, we will have to share our faith. I saw this great analogy for the church this week on a blog that I read sometimes, and it asked the question, is your church a horse or a mule? I'd never thought about it that way before. I don't know. <laughs> and it, it, made, it made the point. So a horse, if you look at a really, a really good thoroughbred horse, like a Kentucky Derby running horse, you can look through his genealogy. And you can see this whole line of champion horses, and you can study its body and see how all of the best things about being a horse have been passed down from generation to generation through these horses to create this strong, beautiful, perfect specimen of a horse. So you, you can build up the muscles of your champion horses, and you can get the right hoof structure and leg structure and, and all of these things to make it the perfect horse and then that gets passed down from generation to generation of horses. So that's a horse. So a mule, on the other hand, is kind of this weird creature that probably shouldn't actually exist. Someone was joking to me earlier that there was maybe another word that I could have used, but, <laughs> but actually, a mule and a donkey are not the same thing. A mule is what you get when a donkey and a horse breed together. And, and so mules are they're really strong and they're really helpful animals to have around. A mule can plow a field like nothing else and mules played a pretty, pretty large part in American history. Some of the hiking trails we have in the mountains were forged by pack mules carrying pioneers supplies and all their stuff on them. So they can work hard and they're strong and they're really useful. But the thing about a mule is they can't produce any offspring. They're sterile. So once that mule dies, they have no way of passing on any of their strength or their usefulness to any other generation. Once they're gone, that's it. So the question was, is your church a horse or is it a mule? Is your church a church that takes everything that's good about being a disciple of Christ and passes it on from generation to generation? 
Or is it a mule that is good and it's strong and it's useful while we're here? But once all of us are gone, the church is gone. It, it was a really good question and it got me thinking, especially because there's it's kind of a crisis in the church, a lot of people say. Um, young, young adults are leaving the church in droves right now. I have this book um, written by a guy named David Kinneman. He works with the Barna Group, if you've heard of them. They do a lot of surveys and polls and stuff to help churches understand themselves and the rest of the world. Um, so he did all kinds of research about why people in their early 20s, late teens are leaving the church. Um, and some of, some of what they learned, the book, by the way, is called You Lost Me. Um, some of what they learned is that high schoolers are actually the most religiously active group in all of America right now. There's kind of two or three years usually in high school where teenagers really kind of grab onto their faith and they want to experiment and learn things and see what this all means for their lives. But then something gets lost between maybe 17 and 20. And by the time they hit 20 years old, they leave the church. So there was all this research done to write this book and figure out why this is happening. And they kind of expected to learn that there's something about that switch to college or some kind of, you know, they're independent for the first time or they hit their first real crisis in life. Um, but what they found was really interesting. I'll read you a couple of quick little stories from the book, um, from some of the interviews that they did. So Kinneman writes, as I was finishing the final edits on this book, I ran into Liz a 20-something from my home church in Ventura, California. When she was in high school, I had been an adult volunteer in her youth group, and she told me that despite her upbringing in church and attendance at a Christian college, she had been struggling with feelings of isolation in her church and judgment from her Christian peers. So recently she met a family from another religious faith, and she was really impressed by how they loved her and cared for her and took her in. So she said, a few weeks ago, I decided to convert, and I joined them instead. Another quote from an online survey that they did um, says, I wonder what percentage of lost Christians feel like I do, that I didn't leave the church. The church left me. There's a lot of pain in these answers. And what they learned doing all this research is that people in their early 20s were leaving the church not because of something that happened in their early 20s, but because no one invested in them when they were children and growing up in the church. No one seemed to really care that they were there, that no one wanted to hear their struggles or hear what they believed or hear what they were going through. They were just ignored, and so by the time they got to 20, they were fed up and they left. And this is happening all across the country and around the world, really. There's this common theme that no one invested in them as children. There's another study I read that puts it in a little bit more positive light, I guess, that says um, when children grow up in the church, to give them the best chance of having a faith that sticks with them through adulthood, the best thing that the church can do is help them build relationships with at least three adults who aren't their parents. And that sets them up with a strong foundation and a strong faith just by having those relationships. And I can, I can see that in my own life. I can look back and I could tell you at least three people who weren't related to me, who really just took an interest in me and wanted to learn my gifts and help me get plugged in. And I think that has a lot to do with why I went to seminary and now I'm here working at Harbor Church as a pastor. It, it really changed my life that people really cared and wanted to get to know me. You see, our passage this morning shows us that all of this isn't really an option. This isn't something for Juan and Diane to do in the back on Sunday mornings. This is something we all need to do. We have to share our faith. We have to raise up this next generation, or we'll be like that mule. We'll be strong and useful now, but when we're gone, the church is gone. There are lots of family studies in psychology and even, I guess, just common sense that say, you know, as we grow up and as we go through life and build relationships, we're going to pass on something. So shouldn't that something be our love and our faith in Jesus Christ? In Psalm 71, got to get this open. 
This one-handed thing is hard. Um, Psalm 71, verse 17. The psalmist is an old man writing this, and he says, Since my youth, God, you've taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even now, when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, and I will declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who come. We're called to always be declaring what God has done in our lives and in the lives of people around us. We're called to pass on our faith to the next generation of believers and leaders in the church. We're called to let our faith be so visible and so transparent that, we're, that it's like it's written all over our foreheads or on the doors to our house. And we can't help but pass it on. I think the story of Paul and Timothy in the New Testament is so powerful with this. John talked a little bit about Paul and Timothy last, last week. But the story is, you know, Paul, as we all know, was this great apostle and missionary, and he went all over the world telling people about Jesus and spreading the gospel. But even Paul took the time to mentor this young man named Timothy. And he, he raised him up, and he, he built him up to be the next great leader of the early church. And in 2 Timothy, in the beginning, you can read names of people that invested in Timothy along with Paul. It talks about his grandmother and his mother. And later in 2 Timothy, there are some other people named. It's so clear that all of these people in the early church saw something in Timothy and wanted to raise him up and pass on their faith so that he could come up and lead after Paul was finished. It's this incredible story. So how do we, as Harvard Church, go forward? How do we come alongside the children and the teenagers here at the harbor and raise them up? First of all, I think we can pass on our knowledge. That might seem kind of obvious, and it's probably the thing that the church often does the best. But we can tell Bible stories, and we can talk about Moses and Abraham and Noah and the ark. Those things are important because they teach us about who God is and how God works in our lives. So we can tell those stories, and we need to tell those stories. Uh, I have a book at home called Helping Our Children Grow in Faith by Robert Keeley, who is actually a professor of mine in college. Um, and he talks about helping children develop a 3D faith, a faith that affects their heads and their hearts and their spirit. And a big part of that is passing on our knowledge about the Bible and about Jesus Christ and learning those stories that we all learned in Sunday school. Children need to know about Jesus and about his life and death and resurrection, just like adults do. In our passage this morning, it talks about spreading the, the commandments of God, that stuff of our faith, that knowledge of theology or doctrine or biblical truth that needs to be passed on. But if you ask me, this is kind of the easy part of passing on the next generation. It's pretty easy to sit and to read a story or to, to talk about what we read in the Bible. I think the next couple of things are harder. <laughs> so another way we can raise up the, generation, the next generation is providing opportunities for them in the church. We should have our children being, being involved in worship or being involved in our service to the neighborhood or even talking with our church leaders and, and having their voices heard so our church can better reflect them and enfold them together. It's so important that we provide opportunities and make space for our children and our junior hires and teenagers to be serving alongside us in ministry. I remember when I was in first grade, about seven years old or so, the church where I grew up apparently had a lot of kids because we had two different children's choirs. One was kind of the little kids' choir for preschoolers or kindergartners. And then once you were really big, like a first grader, then you got to go to the big kids' choir. So I've, I've loved to sing since I could make noise. So I was so excited. I, I loved singing in the little kids' choir, but I was so excited to get to the big kids' choir and sing with all the big kids in early elementary. <laughs> um, so when I turned seven, when I was going into first grade, I was ready to go, ready to sing in the big kids' choir, and the woman who led the choirs kind of pulled me aside one day and asked if I'd be willing to stay in the little kids' choir just for one more year. At first, I thought I was in trouble, <laughs> or maybe, maybe I wasn't good enough to be in the big kids' choir, I had done something wrong, so I had to be stuck or left behind. But then she explained, you know, I, I still got to go to the big kids' choir, 
But she told me she saw something in me and she wanted me to help teach the music to the little kids. That was such a big moment for me as a little first grader. <laughs> she told me that, you know, basically what she was telling me was that I had gifts and that I was important and that I could help. I wasn't just something to be used or someone who could fill in a gap. She was telling me that I mattered. And that stuck with, it still sticks with me today as an adult. So when we create these opportunities like that for our children to serve and to even be leaders among their peers or with us as adults, we're telling them that they're worthwhile to us and to God. They matter to God and they have things they can bring to the table and that's important and it matters. It's such an incredible affirmation to be given a role in the church. And it means something and it sticks with people for the rest of their lives, even when we do that in the young age. And it changes us as adults in the church too. You know, when we see children working in the garden or helping us lead worship on Sunday mornings, it changes how we see ourselves and how we see God. We can recognize how big God's love is and how big his kingdom is that we get to be a part of. It's so important for us to be creating space and making opportunities for children and for, for youth to be serving with us. This church isn't just for adults, it's for God's children of all ages. And just like, you know, we did the Kingdom Challenge a couple months ago because we wanted everyone to be unleashed to go do ministry. And we need the same for our children to unleash them to go do ministry where they are with their peers. And it goes such a long way in passing on the faith to that next generation. And then finally, and I think this is the most important thing and also the most difficult thing, I think God calls us to make real, deep, meaningful relationships with people in our church of all ages. This is probably the most important and the most impactful and the most difficult thing we can do with each other and with people of all ages in our church, young and old. But it matters because it's in relationship that we learn what it really means to be a child of God. Relationships are where this investment happened. All those things that the people in David Kinnaman's book felt were lacking, this is what happens in relationship. And so it's so important that we get to know each other and ask questions, even of those who are the smallest among us. It's so important that we, we recognize that children and teenagers have thoughts and opinions and beliefs, and those things matter. <laughs> Tim's raising his hand back there like, yes, I do. <laughs> And those are important, and we need to hear those and be shaped by those as a church as well. And that happens in relationship. I've been, I've been really struck the last couple of months with the importance of just asking questions. So I notice this thing in myself where I'm talking to someone and someone tells me a story and then I'll jump in with my own story that connects or maybe explains <coughs> something. And I've, I've noticed that that tends to make it all about me when I'm talking, right? I bring it back to me somehow. So I've been trying in the last couple of months to be really intentional when I'm talking with people to just ask a question next. If someone tells me a story, don't jump in with my own information, but just come up with a follow-up question. And it's incredible how that changes the conversation. You can get so much deeper, so much faster, and it goes beyond small talk into a real conversation. And it means something to the people that we talk to. So if it means something to us as adults, can you imagine what it would mean to a child if we just asked them what they did on Saturday afternoon? Or what was their favorite thing about their past school year that just finished? Can you imagine how affirming and how uplifting it would be to have someone in the church take an interest in you and want to really get to know you and love you even at a young age. I, there was a church that I was a part of that had um, a really large group of high school students. And some of the, the elders and the leaders and the pastor were starting to notice that you know the youth group was really close and they were tight and then the adults were really close but the two never ever mixed. So they did this really bold thing and they started inviting some of the high schoolers to their meetings once a month with the elders and deacons and pastor 
And they just started asking questions. And they just wanted to hear what, what the students were thinking about or what they believed or what struggles they were going through. And all of a sudden, their church started to change in little ways. Their worship changed a little bit or the preaching changed a little bit. And it was the high schoolers that started shaping their church. It changed everything. And all of a sudden, the adults and the high schoolers were building relationships and that gave all of these high schoolers as they went off to college and into adulthood this great foundation of faith that I hope stuck with them for the rest of their lives. It was just this simple thing of listening and asking questions and making an effort to build that relationship that changed that whole church forever. It's so incredible what can happen in the life of a person when we just take the time to get to know them and listen to their stories and their struggles. Plus, when we build relationships with, with someone who's younger or someone who's a child or a teenager, we get to become an example for them of what this whole faith thing looks like. And what better way to pass on our faith than to show someone what it looks like to pray or what it looks like to worship or what it looks like to serve in the community. It can be an incredible example. So then they see how we live out our faith and then we see how they grow in their faith and it can be this beautiful, circular kind of relationship where we learn from each other. So Harbor Church, the question this morning is, are we going to be a horse church or a mule church? Are we going to be that church that takes the best of what it is to be a Christian and a disciple of Christ and pass that on from generation to generation? Or will we be strong and useful now, but when we're gone, Harbor Church is gone? Will we be a horse or a mule? I know I'm not John, but I have some homework for us all. <laughs> we have his approval, that's good. So, um, my challenge to all of us, myself included, I'm not exempt. Sometime between now and the end of summer, I invite you to, to stop and have a meaningful conversation with one of our children in the back room with Juan and Diane or one of our teenagers here. Just stop and ask some questions. So my challenge is to have three of those meaningful, meaningful conversations before school starts again in fall. If it's really true that a child needs just three adults to invest in them, to give them that foundation and that faith that lasts forever, look around and you can do the math and figure out how many disciples we can be building between now and fall. Will you do that with me? Great. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this challenge, and we thank you that your family is so much bigger than maybe we even can expect or imagine. So God, we pray that you will use us and that you will work through us to create disciples of all ages, young and old. In your name we pray all of this. Amen.